And good morning, Living Hope. God bless you for another Living Hope Today devotional. Here we are, so thankful that we can be together again. Thanks again for sharing and liking and subscribing and sending these things all over the world. And if you're watching from some other place today, other than Denver, Colorado, we want to say welcome and we're happy you're here. Praise God. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. Uh, it's called the birth narrative. It's about the beginnings of Jesus as he's born into this world in the manger. And we're going to pick it up at a very interesting spot. But before we get there, I want to just remind you that if you want to participate in this by letting me know what's happening with you as you go through these devotionals, that would be a wonderful thing for me. Um, you know, just ask yourself the question, what does this passage teach me about the Lord? What's it teaching me about myself? Is there something that needs to change in my life? Um, if you don't want to leave that sort of information in the comments section, no problem. Just simply uh, email me at pastorscott at elivinghope.org. It's in the description below, and I'd love to hear from you. And if not, that's okay too. But I thought the more you process these verses and these truths that God delivers to us, the easier it is for you to absorb them. And, and I just want to try to have that exercise in your life as I have it in mine every day as I move through these PowerPoint presentations and grapple with what's really being said here. It helps me to write it down. It really does. So this morning, let's get right to Matthew chapter 2 and see where we're at there. Let's see if I can make this thing work. There we go. We're going to start in chapter 1. But as he considered these things, this is talking about Joseph. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save their people from their sin." Now keep in mind, church, that one of the things Matthew's trying to do for us is he's trying to help us understand that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One, the Promised One. If you read earlier in chapter 1, he's told us that he has the lineage of Abraham in his veins. He has the lineage of David in his veins. He is the rightful heir to the Davidic throne as the Messiah was predicted to be. Jesus fulfills those requirements. But from the human standpoint, Joseph, for instance, he finds out that his betrothed, Mary, is pregnant and he can't figure it out. An angel comes to him and says, look, this has happened by God's will. She's bearing a son that's from the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, I want you to name him Jesus because he's going to save their, his people from their sin. It's so profound to me to understand this from Joseph's point of view. He's now in a position where he's just going to obey God blindly, but not really blindly. He's heard from God. But I want you to understand one thing as we go through this text today, and that is that sometimes when you're right where God wants you, when you're doing right what God wants you to do, life can be very hard life can be a real challenge we'll see that in joseph's life he first hears from the angel and matthew reinforces to us that this is god's working to help us understand that jesus is the christ all this took place to fulfill what the lord had spoken by the prophet behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name emmanuel which means god with us okay that's from isaiah well the passage moves forward. We learn more about how we should understand Jesus is the Christ. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, let me set the scene here. The kingmakers from Persia have come to Jerusalem. They are looking for the king. They have seen the star. They have followed the star. They have come to Herod to ask him, where is this king of the Jews? Now, Herod's a very insecure pagan. He's always worried about his power base and who might be trying to take over. And he's listening to these kingmakers from Persia who showed up out of nowhere asking him where the king was born. Well, here, here's what they say to him. And just, just look at what God does here. In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. Again, notice that Matthew is taking us back to fulfilled prophecy. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For 
From you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We see this in Micah 5 too, if you want to go look this up. In other words, one of the reasons that we can rest assured that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who he says he is, is because hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God inspired the prophet Micah to predict that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So now I want you to understand this. As, as we look at the story, these kingmakers from Persia, they, they leave Herod's presence. And it says, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Just from Joseph's perspective, think about what's happening. First, the angel tells him to take Mary as his wife, even though she's pregnant, because her pregnancy is due to the Holy Spirit. In other words, the curse of sin is going to be bypassed in the conception of Jesus. He's going to be born sinless, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Okay, then Joseph sees these kingmakers from Persia laden down with gifts coming to him to bow down before the baby Jesus, to bow down and worship. And not just worship, but offer him treasures, very expensive things, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's, it's incredible from Joseph's perspective. He has to be scratching his head wondering what is going on. And, and it tells us now in the text we're going to study today, And now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Now this is the second time an angel has come to Joseph, right? Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Now isn't that phenomenal? Flee to Egypt. Really? I mean, I, I thought, you know, we were... Uh, in charge of bringing the Christ into the world. That's what you said. He's going to save his people from his sins. We have to run for it. We have to flee for our lives. What does it say? The angel says, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Herod, the one who heard from the Persian kingmakers that there was a king of the Jews born in Bethlehem, has decided not to bow before the Son of God, but to kill the Son of God. Wow. This is why the angel warns Joseph. And so what does Joseph do? And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Here's another fulfillment passage from Matthew. Out of Egypt I called my son. If you want to read about that, you can find that passage in Hosea 11.1. 1. In other words, hundreds of years before the Christ is born, we're told that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. We're told that he's going to be called out of Egypt. And now we see that as Joseph serves God and tries to obey everything God wants, the angels come to him twice. Take this woman to be your wife, even though she's pregnant, and get out of here. Run for it. Go to Egypt. Think of the contrast going on in Joseph's mind where he knew he was giving birth. He was, he was watching the king of Israel be born, the savior of Israel be born, but now... God in the flesh has to run for it. They have to get out of there because Herod wants to kill them. And as the passage goes on, we're, Herod, we're told that Herod does exactly that. When Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. And he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Understand that Herod has murder in his heart. Herod is trying to eliminate all his competition. And Herod is an evil, evil, evil man. But what Matthew wants to point out to us is that this then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. What did Jeremiah say? 
A voice was heard in Rama, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now this is some pretty deep water. We, we hear from the prophet Jeremiah that Rachel's weeping. And what's really going on here? I think we should just take a little detour. It's in Jeremiah 31 if you want to look it up. Let's look at what it says here. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. What's happening here is the children of God are being exiled. They're being taken away because of their consistent disobedience. But I want you to see how this passage proceeds. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping. The God of God says, stop crying and your eyes from tears. For there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. So we see that the weeping in Jeremiah 31 is also part of the rejoicing that there will be a day where the children of Israel will be returned to the promised land. Now take that to Matthew chapter 2 and put it in context and you'll see that what God is saying in what many ways here is, yeah, okay, Rachel's weeping and this is part of the prophecy because Herod is killing the babies. There are many ladies crying because their little baby boys have been executed. But God says, look, there's going to be restoration. There's going to be healing and redemption. Just like in Jeremiah 31, the Son of God will be called out of Egypt again to be brought forward to bring salvation to his people. So Herod eventually dies. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. Here's the third time. Now what is he told? Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So now we're going to see Jesus, through his parents, Joseph and Mary, coming out of Egypt. Again, he rose, he took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. Again, just like Rachel needs to stop crying because her children are going to return to the promised land. Now, although there's been terrible tragedy, God's salvation is coming out of Egypt to return to the land of Israel to do the work of salvation. It's so profound how God fits all this together over centuries and centuries of time. It keeps telling us, driving it home to us, that Jesus is the Messiah. There is none other like him. And just look how this passage wraps up for us today. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, now, Archelaus is another Herod. He's a descendant of Herod. He's, he's very volatile, just like his father. He's, he's a guy that you don't want to mess with. In fact, Joseph must have heard about who Archelaus is because Joseph said, I'm not going back to Bethlehem. I'm not going back to where we started. This is not good. He was afraid to go there, it says, and being warned in a dream. Again, God is guiding Joseph being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. He withdrew to the district of Galilee and watch this. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. Here it is again, another fulfillment prophecy that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth had this really bad rap. Nobody liked Nazareth. Nobody thought anything good would come out of Nazareth. If you follow Jesus through the Gospels and they're trying to figure out if he's really the Christ and his enemies are talking about it, one of them says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I, I want to just show you what this is about. You see Jerusalem at the bottom of the map? Uh, Bethlehem's just under Jerusalem about five miles south of Jerusalem. Okay, well, Nazareth is where? Nazareth is way up where that yellow circle is, up by the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus was raised. 
even though he was born in Bethlehem because of the census and because of the prophet Micah's prediction, he was raised in Nazareth, way up there. Now, I want you to think about this. Okay, it's one thing for a prophet to prophesy that you're going to be born in Bethlehem. I mean, maybe out of astronomical odds, uh, you can be born in Bethlehem. But then the, the prophets have also foretold that you're going to come out of Egypt. Okay, and then they've told us that you're going to be raised in Nazareth. Now, what Messiah, what prophet, what, what astronomical odds are there that all three of these places would line up perfectly in the person of the Messiah? There is an unmistakable flag flying in the Gospel of Matthew saying, This is the Christ. This is the only person that fulfills these three things, let alone all these other things. Bethlehem, Egypt, Nazareth, profound. But another thing I want you to see as we close today is that God's in, at work even when things are hard. Joseph understands he's supposed to take Mary. He obeys. Joseph, instead of living a beautiful life while he watches the Son of God grow into uh, the person who's going to go to the cross and redeem the world, what happens? Joseph ends up running, running for his life, running for their lives to Egypt. How long did he stay there? Well, we're not really sure, but it was more than a little while. He had to try to survive in Egypt. He tried to, had to learn how to deal with their customs and their ways. And what happens? Just like Moses comes out of Egypt to the promised land, to deliver his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Now we see Jesus coming out of Egypt to deliver us from the bondage of sin. And the prophets also said, Nazareth, Nazareth is where the Messiah will be raised. That's where he's going to be living. He's going to be called a Nazarene. Joseph ends up heading for Nazareth instead of being in Bethlehem. Joseph's life is completely turned upside down while he is exactly where he is supposed to be doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. What do we take from this? Understand God is always in control. When we yield our hearts to him and obey him, no matter what our circumstances look like, we can trust in the sovereign purpose of God in our lives and hold on to him. Praise God, today we see all the more evidence to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. We give our lives to him anew and afresh, knowing that he really is the way, the truth, and the life. Take it with you today. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Honor him with your life. Praise him in all things that we do today. Let's just rejoice in the fact that the King is here to save us. God bless you. Serve him well today.